that's your choice. So yeah, welcome everybody to our Two Valleys Mission Community service for this Sunday, the 14th of February. Um, so we've muted everybody and you remain muted um, throughout and we'll um, operate things much as we did the last couple of times we use Zoom. And so we'll share, I'm going to share my screen with you in a moment so that you can see the words of the service um, and uh, please feel free to join in singing the hymns at home. Michelle and I will attempt to sing them for you. If you remain muted, you can join in singing with them <coughs> at home. Um, and then we've got a couple of people reading Bible readings for us. Um, and Hilary Fitch is preaching for us a little later. So we look forward to that. So let me see if I can share my screen. And then you should be able to see the words for our service this morning. So let's be still for a moment or two. If you would join in the bold type responses each time. Praise the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. Lord, open our lips and we shall praise your name. Let us pray. Give us, our Father, a sense of your presence as we gather now for worship. Grant us gratitude as we remember your goodness, penitence as we remember our sins, and joy as we remember your love, and enable us to lift up our hearts in humble prayer and fervent praise, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And a wonderful psalm of praise, the last of the Psalms, 150, will say all these words all together. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Alleluia. Oh, praise God in his holiness. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the blast of the trumpet. Praise him upon the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dances. Praise him upon the strings and pipe. Praise him with ringing cymbals. Praise him upon the clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Alleluia. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Oh, 
and perish, but not change Great Father of glory, you Father of light, thine angels adore thee, unveiling their sight. All praise we would render, all help us to see, it is only the splendor of light's brightness. So let's take some moments of stillness as we come to God to confess our sins, all that is wrong within our own lives, but also within the life of the world. So a moment of stillness as we prepare to pray this prayer together. So we pray together. Almighty God, long suffering and of great goodness, we confess to you, we confess with our whole heart our neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, our wrongdoing, thinking, and speaking, the hurts we have done to others, and the good we have left undone. O oh God, forgive us, for we have sinned against you and raise us to newness of life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those that with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Penny, I think, is going to bring our first reading for us. The first reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. St. Paul writes, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. 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 So let us join in this canticle together. We'll say the antiphon all together, and, and then I will say the odd numbered verses, and Michelle will lead you all in the even numbered verses. So you just join in with the even numbered verses from home. So we say together, our hope is not in vain because God's love has been poured into our hearts. God reckons as righteous those who believe, who believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead. For Christ was handed over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Christ we have gained access to the grace in which we stand and rejoice in our hope of the glory of God. We even exult in our sufferings, 
for suffering produces endurance and endurance brings hope and our hope is not in vain because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. God proves his love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by his death, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? Therefore we exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have now received our reconciliation. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, now and shall be for ever. Amen. Amen. Our hope is not in vain, because God's love has been poured into our hearts. And Vanda's going to read for us our second reading. The second reading, reading is taken from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, they were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Pause just for a moment of stillness as we reflect on the readings we've heard. And Hilary is going to bring to us our sermon for this week. Good morning to you. Now, there have been lots of repeats on television during lockdown, giving us the opportunity, perhaps, to see things that we missed the first time round. And there's one such series that Tony and I have been enjoying, and it's called Britain's Lost Masterpieces with the magnificently named art historian, Bendor Grosvenor. He identifies paintings which are lurking in a collection somewhere, but which he thinks have more to them than meets the eye. And they may even have been painted by an important artist in the past. The painting being investigated often looks dull and uninteresting with muted colors under a dark coating of brown varnish. The painting is first taken to a conservator who works on the painting while Bendor goes away and investigates its origins. Behind the scenes, the conservator is painstaking, painstakingly working away, removing the old varnish section by section with a cotton swab soaked in cleaning fluid. The part of the programme that I really love is usually at the very end, when we return to the conservator to see the cleaned and restored picture. The results are remarkable. We can see the painting as it was meant to be. The colours glow and we can see the detail of the painter's technique in every brushstroke, 
that was invisible before. Truly a revelation. What was ordinary is now remarkable. In the reading from Mark's Gospel, we have the well-known and perhaps rather startling story of the transfiguration or transformation of Jesus. To set the scene for what happens, if we look back into the previous chapter, Jesus has been asking the disciples about who they think he is. Who do you say that I am? He says. And Peter replies in simple but emphatic terms, you are the Christ. Peter is probably speaking for the rest of the disciples in saying this. They have been with Jesus, they have heard his teachings and seen the miracles he has performed. They recognize Jesus as the Messiah, God's anointed one, sent to rescue God's people as prophesied in the scriptures. But they haven't got the full picture yet of how this will play out. When Jesus starts to talk to them about what lies ahead, teaching them how he must suffer and be crucified and then rise again, the disciples cannot recognize this as, this, as him being the Messiah as they think he should be. Peter is so shocked by the idea that God's Messiah would be killed that he says that it cannot possibly be allowed to happen. And Jesus strongly reprimands him saying, get behind me, Satan. Peter is seeing things from an earthly point of view and not from God's perspective. A few verses later on, and Jesus says to the disciples, I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. And it's six days after he says this, that Jesus leads Peter, James and John up a high mountain. And what happens then? Well, it's not easy to explain or to offer a neat solution. It's a supernatural event. But the three disciples saw Elijah and Moses with Jesus. But Jesus was transformed, his clothes shining dazzlingly bright. Time was perhaps somehow pinched together. God was showing them the past and the future. Moses, the lawgiver, who had led God's people to the promised land, and Elijah, one of the greatest of the prophets, both part of the plan to bring in God's kingdom in the person of Jesus. Jesus, who is shown glorified, bathed in the light of God's power and love. The eyes of the disciples are being opened to see beyond the ordinary, to see the reality of God's kingdom and that Jesus truly is the Messiah. And the voice from the cloud affirms what they have seen. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. No doubt the disciples still felt overwhelmed, shocked, and even baffled when they came down the mountain with Jesus. Despite what they had seen, they still had a lot to learn and struggled with their understanding of what was going on, especially during the events leading up to Jesus's crucifixion. But they did listen to Jesus and eventually the pieces fell into place and they saw God's plan revealed on earth in Jesus. And they would remember what they had seen on the mountain. Now, later on, of course, on the road to Damascus, the Apostle Paul also encountered Jesus in a flash of searing light in which he saw the risen Jesus in all his glory. This event transformed the life of Paul because he realized that if Jesus was risen from the dead, 
he was indeed the Messiah, God's son, and the image of God. It changed Paul from being one who persecuted Christ's followers to one whose vocation was, was to take the gospel of truth to all who would listen. And in our reading, we heard a short snippet from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Paul has visited Corinth and spent time there with the church, but now he kept in touch with them through his letters. His second letter deals with problems they were having with false teachers who were not teaching the true gospel of Christ, but who manipulated it for their own ends. Some were in it for the money, and others were only interested in, in improving their own standing in the church rather than attracting people to Jesus. Paul wants to make it plain that his purpose in preaching the message of Jesus is not for his own benefit and not to promote himself. Indeed, he stresses that he is a servant bringing to them the message of Jesus, his Lord and master. And that this Jesus is the son of God, the God who is no stranger, but none other than the creator, whose first act was to say, let there be light. And it is this light of revelation that shines into people's hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. What Paul is writing about has implications for us modern day Christians too, not just for the people of Corinth or others we may read about in the Bible. And we all have a ministry, a way of serving others. Our ministry may come in many forms, but when we became Christians and accepted Jesus, we metaphorically looked at the shining face of Jesus reflecting the glory of God into our hearts. And we too must reflect this light into the world so that others may share in it. And we do this by following Jesus in all that we do in our daily lives, by how we behave in our family life and in the workplace, in how we treat others and by being open about our faith. It's never been easy to be a Christian. In some parts of the world, there is outright persecution of Christians by the state or by other groups of people. For us in the West, we can be looked upon as being rather foolish and simple. There is always somebody ready to tell you that faith in Jesus is just a crutch for the psychologically weak or that society has now outgrown the concept of having to have a God to worship. We have moved on. Now we just have to follow the science and we'll soon have all the answers. But we must not be put off. People do have consciences and spiritual needs. And living in lockdown has perhaps given some people time for reflection. Other people's minds might be obscured to the message of God's love by pain, loss, or suffering. Others might be blinded to the message by the busyness of their lives. They're too busy working or raising their families to think about that sort of thing now, but perhaps maybe later. For others, it may be their comfortable lifestyles that make them feel self-sufficient and protected. But the light of the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit is able to break through any obstruction in the minds and hearts of people. But they do need to hear and see the message in action. And that is where we come in. It is up to us. Amen.
be still for a moment as we reflect on Hillary's powerful words. So we're going to sing our second hymn, There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's Own Son. And let us declare together what we believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not known of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so let us pray. 
Almighty Father, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon a cross, give us grace to perceive his glory, that we may be strengthened to suffer with him and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord of light, transfigure us, increase our vision and reveal to us your glory. May your church seek to transform our darkest places with your light. May we seek out the lost, the deprived, the poor and the rejected and bring them home to you and your love. We pray for the mission and outreach of the whole church and especially this Two Valleys Mission community. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Come, Lord of light, transfigure our towns and our cities. We pray for areas of danger, for places of despair, for those in poor housing and those on the streets. Lord, transform our places of poverty, change our attitudes for the better towards each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of light, come transfigure our homes, that they may be radiant with your presence. Make them homes of peace and kindliness, of holiness and hospitality, of grace and goodness, that you may be known to be among us. We pray especially for all those who have been homeschooling in this time, for teachers, parents and children. And during this half-term break, we ask for your refreshment and a sense of hope for the future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord of light and love, transfigure and sustain our hospitals and nursing homes at this time. We pray for all those whose lives have been devastated by illness and loss. We pray for all who are downcast or fearful. We pray for our scientists and all who strive to help and support us. We give thanks for Steve and Riley's successful knee operation this week and continue to pray for him and his family as he recovers. We pray for all who are awaiting hospital, hospital treatment or operations and for all who seek healing and hope. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. And we give thanks for all who have passed beyond death and been transformed in your glorious kingdom. For the saints, for our benefactors, for loved ones departed, that we like them may come to the fullness of your presence. This week we remember from our book of remembrance across the two valleys, Joyce Chadwick, Robert Jeffrey Wills, Roger Barrett, Canham Bill Greeton, Heather Cotton, Penny Much, Katrina Hardman, Tommy Loudon, William Robson, Ken Hopper, and Pauline Mills, whose anniversaries fall this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And so we draw all our prayers together, including those on our hearts today, as our Saviour taught us. So we pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so we sing our final <laughs> hymn. Go forth and tell, O Church of God, awake, picking up the theme of our <coughs> readings and our sermon this week. 
And so we draw our service to a close with this concluding prayer. Let us pray. Living Lord, as we offer to you our common life, refresh our vision that we may know your will and seek to follow you in all our ways. May we follow daily as your disciples, care deeply for one another in community, speak boldly, your gospel words of love and tread gently as faithful stewards of your goodness. We ask this in the power of your name as creator, redeemer and sustainer of our lives today and forever. Amen. Amen. And we say the words of the grace together. May, May the, the grace, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us and those whom we love now and forever. Amen. Well, our service has come to an end. Um, some of you might like to, to stay behind and linger for um, some further chat together. So we'll wait and see who, who remains and maybe split up into a couple of groups. Um, we welcome, as part of our congregation this morning, Melissa and Chris and Lydia and Sam, who've been with us. They are planning to get married this year in our churches and so are attending uh, by Zoom uh, to, in order to qualify uh, to be married. So it's good to have you with us. Uh, as well this week um, and this week as you know is the beginning of Lent so Ash Wednesday is coming up on Wednesday and we're going to do a live Zoom Holy Communion service uh, from here the Vicarage mm -hmm. uh, at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning so it's the same login details you had for this service today it's a recurring <laughs> meeting um, and so if any of you want to join us for 10 o'clock just before 10 o'clock on Wednesday 
then uh, do do that for Ash Wednesday. And we think we're going to ask you to ash yourselves. So you might want to have some ash ready um, to make a mark of the cross on your forehead with some ash that we traditionally do at the beginning of Lent. I'll leave that up to you. It's a purely voluntary optional thing, um, but we will include that ashing as part of the communion service. So I'll email out some details on that again before Wednesday. Um, but uh, it'd be lovely to see some of you by Zoom.